Welcome to the Shifter, everybody. I am Will. And I'm Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Yeah, so actually, before we get into anything, uh, Matt uh, may or may not have interacted with two, if not three, of the drivers we slander the most on this program. So, Matt, if you'd like to issue a few apologies, Ricky um, Stenhouse actually doesn't fall into that category. We don't slander him. No. Um, Corey LaJoy, uh, I do not issue you an apology because your golf cart driver did not stop for me and Dante. Fuck you, Corey LaJoy. Yeah, I'm saying it. I'll say this word because I don't think my family has time to watch the show right now. Fuck you, Corey LaJoy. All right. So, oh, no. and if you did watch it's the show. The first five minutes, we're not going to get any traction. <laughs> we're not getting monetized, Will. All right. So, uh, no. And the this one, is and the one video that we have a shot of getting monetized on this channel is not getting monetized because of copyright. So, yeah, but it was it was worth it. It was worth it for an amazing video. But um, Carson Hosevar, we do not slander you, but we met Carson Hosevar, Ricky Stenhouse. We also do not slander. I've actually met Ricky Stenhouse Jr. twice, and both times he's been very cool. Uh, Daytona, I actually met him because Donald Trump was at the race, and um, we uh had to go through the Secret Service to get into the race, and then we watched the man almost die. Well, of course, after rain, uh, Brian Newman's okay, guys. It's okay. Um, and then uh, we met Austin Dillon, who told uh, conservative jokes and WWE jokes. Hey, you said he was cool. He was funny. The story he told about his son uh, saying that he only calls for water breaks at the soccer games was pretty funny. And then uh, he gave Dante a hug. That actually did not happen. Dante did not get a hug from Austin Dillon. Did you? Um. Yeah, he said something about, no, no, I didn't get a hug. Hey, guys, we're not alleging that Austin Dillon's racist. And uh, speaking of people that, like, um, you know how Austin Dillon has sponsors and he shouldn't? Well, we have sponsors and we shouldn't, so I'm going to talk about them. Uh, Will has the logo in the background. Uh, it's back there. Uh, Bree just had her birthday, so everybody tell Bree happy late birthday. Will obviously did not tell her happy birthday because he hates Bree. Um. Milan, go watch her show if her YouTube channel still exists. I don't really know. Uh, hopefully it's there. Um, then uh, Terrell, go uh, buy his clothes uh, that are correctly priced. Uh, they're they should be more expensive than they are. Actually, he's giving you guys a great deal. Um, and by the way, uh, Will Will does not wear his clothes. Will just does not. What do you mean? Me. This is the 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 maid of the mist. Uh, sweatshirt is exclusively a Terrell Newble classic. I don't know the name of his clothing brand, <laughs> so it's a Grateful Studios. Grateful Studios, They're up to fifteen thousand followers on Instagram. Last time I checked, he's doing very good. Um, that reminds me, I met a guy in, in CVS that makes cool baseball hats. Oh well, he is not sponsored by the channel, so why did you mention him? Well, actually, you know what? I mentioned Gamebridge on the show last week, and they don't sponsor, so it's okay. Um, yeah. it was my Auburn buddy. I have to thank him for getting me through uh, being at that game because being in Jordan Hare Stadium makes me literally nauseous every time I go. Um, I'm sorry, Will. Um, but I'm sure it made, it made you nauseous this weekend, so that's okay. Um, but um, Ant, go watch his YouTube. He's starting uh, a lot of new videos over there, so go watch that. And if Ken still makes videos, I don't know. Go go watch his. And uh, Dante actually just told me uh, 30 minutes before that uh, Tyler the uh, singer of water uh, really likes our show. She's actually totally seen it. And uh, Tyla sponsors our show. And um, yeah, totally. Will, Will knows who Tyla is. Oh yeah. 100%. When, Man, we talk, when we talk about generational musicians, we talk about people that just get it now, 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 now with Tyler. Now here's a guy, that, you know, he's, she, she's looking kind of Mahomey out there. Dylan Raiola, looking a little Mahomey. Yeah. This gotta be racist. Everybody, I'm just gonna keep on going with it. I need you to cut me okay. off. Okay, the NASCAR cut Xfinity Series off. had a race this weekend. They did. They they raced at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Uh, Will did not watch it. Will, who won? Without watching it, yeah. it's a race. Okay. Joey Logano. That is the Cup race. I said the NASCAR Xfinity Series race. I thought you said I. You said the Cup race. I said Xfinity. Play it back. Actually, go back ten seconds. You will hear me say Xfinity. Oh, um, yeah, I watched this show back. <laughs> <laughs> I do, too. Um, But, no, uh, Austin Hill won. Uh, it's a it's a plate race in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Austin Hill won seven, 
his fourth Atlanta race on this configuration where uh, Corey Haima said, screw you, Toyota, and it was a big controversy. Uh, he did not go with his Toyota teammate at the end of the race where they could have beaten him. And then Parker Klingerman got the second. My hopes and dreams of him ever winning a race keep getting ruined and dashed. Um, then uh, the Cup Series playoffs kicked off this weekend at the Quaker State 400. It, there was a – I don't know if it was talked about on the broadcast, but it was talked about at the racetrack. There was obviously a black cloud around this race being in Georgia on this weekend due to the school shooting that happened this past week where four people passed away. They had – Will, why are you looking at me like that and laughing? I wasn't expecting you to bring it up. I'm not even going to warn me, man. We're recording this on 9-11. What? What? <laughs> why are you – You don't You don't understand. You don't understand, right? It's like, not funny. No, it's not funny. You know what? <laughs> no. Funny is, like, no. Yeah, yeah, just talking to Asgar. You don't run me through. It's like, by the way. Because they, made it, they had a big tribute before the race. Didn't know that, Matt. You didn't talk to me. That's not me. What? But apologize. <laughs> apologize. What? Out of line. Pissed off. Very. That's guys, not okay. Guys, what I was trying to me? say is, I was actually trying to have like a cool moment here. The flags were half masked. And then all that stuff. They had a tribute, like a nice little five to 10 minute tribute before the race. It was really cool. Thoughts and prayers go out to all the victims that were involved in that. Uh, it's just a yeah, terrible actually, thing. Uh, another sad element to that, and this is actually very real. So I've, I've been to my girlfriend's school a couple of times to take her lunch. And uh, walking out, uh, the flags are still at half mass. And it's just like, yeah, mm, I, it's, I, very real. it's a very real issue. Let me be clear. It's just I was not expecting I, you to say that. I have I'm a teammate. Don't laugh, don't laugh, don't laugh. A former teammate, I'm not going to say his name because I don't know if he wants to be said on the show, uh, but he actually teaches in the school district there, and they're going through a lot. So it's a very serious situation regardless of what Will just laughed at. I'm sorry. Ah! So basically, all right, it's a playoff race. We're going to Atlanta. It was a very different Atlanta race. The, in Georgia, the weather's crazy. It's like sandblasting the track constantly, okay? See, that's the other thing is that when you said there was a black cloud, I was originally thinking like, oh, I didn't realize there were weather implications. Oh. But that's not what you were talking about. I you're wasn't going to mention it. Tragedy. You know what? <laughs> Just wait till we get to the big crash on the last time. All right. So, um, the track is constantly being basically sandblasted all the time because Georgia weather. So, uh, the track is aged. It ages probably like two times of any other track. So, handling was a very big issue in this race compared to the February race. So, you didn't get the big real big pack like you did like you they were in a pack but they could only really go too wide but at one point in this race they did go four wide and they they, they made it work but so early on in the race they were kind of going single file but it wasn't like the choo-choo train that you see at daytona or talladega because they were still making moves but it was kind of like this cool hybrid that i think they originally envisioned for the race where they were kind of single file but people could still make passes but you had to have somebody pushing you but Later on in the race, you could see that it was really hard to get the top going, and that would be a common theme in this race. Though they did make it work a couple of times. Ty Gibbs took the lead from Bubba Wallace on the top is the one, the real big one I could think of right off the top of my head. Sorry, Will. Um, but don't look at me like that. <laughs> but um, early on in this race, stage one, it was like uh, dominated by Michael McDowell, who won his fourth straight, fourth straight super speedway pole, which is insane. Um, but uh, his lead would quickly be taken by Ryan Blaney after 27 laps. And then uh, Ryan Blaney would literally just lead the rest of stage one with help from Austin Sindrick. They kind of took off. Eventually, Joey Logano would join them later on in the stage. But the big story of this stage was Kyle Larson. Kyle Larson, who was the only driver early on in this race really making a charge at the Penske guys, was driving that car really hard. He uh, would actually spin himself out trying to do that. And he would go head on into the wall. It has been confirmed that there was not a yeah, terrible. And on top of that, another playoff driver would pile in, a guy who really didn't have a buffer to the cut line because he literally just got in the playoffs last weekend. Uh, Chase Briscoe slammed into the back of Kyle Larson, ending both of their days, meaning Chase Briscoe finished last and Kyle Larson finished next to last. I'll kind of try to keep you guys updated. Chase Briscoe is around 24 points below the cut line, 16th out of 16 drivers in the playoffs right now. Looking like he might need a win early on in this thing. Yeah, and which, by the way, real, real quick, the Larson hit. How did How did that look and sound live? Like, was it uh, as bad live as it was on TV? So, um, me and Dante may have been making fun of J.J. Yaley at the time. Um, so, we just, we didn't, 
we heard bang and then we looked up and we saw smoke and fire and then we heard then we saw the chase briscoe hit that looked terrible but uh each time you saw it at the track it just looked worse but it made a a audible sound that you could hear over every other car it's probably the loudest hit i've heard like we haven't got to at least at the races we've been at together like we've seen some nasty wrecks we've seen flips but we haven't seen like a real big head-on yes we did that I've heard. Jones. I just you can't really hear it. You didn't hear that? No. Oh. Well, I... that's, oh, that's... shoot. Never mind. I forgot about that, Eric. Oh, my God. Never mind. That one was disgusting. I forgot. No, we... That was over in turn three, and we heard that. I totally forgot that hit happened. Yeah, that's what made us look over there. Um, okay. So, we're going to go ahead and jump to stage two here, because stage one, that, that's what it was. And stage two was more of the same, Pitsky dominating, but they would have the Hendrick Motorsports Chevys come back and challenge them with William Byron, Alex Bowman. Talk about Hendrick later. And Chase Elliott. Um, That's... Okay. You talk about the Larson announcement, or you talk about the charter agreement, which you talking about charters? Okay. Um. So um, they would all be working together on top with Alex Bowman leading. Alex Bowman got even with Austin Cindric a couple times, but Austin Cindric would lead every lap of the stage. Actually, Dante looked over at me and he's like, I think cindric has got it. And I'm like, there's 32 laps in the stage. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, Austin Cindric had it. He, he had it in hand. And I actually was just talking to Will about this on the show. You can say what you want about Austin Cindric, but he's probably been one of the best drivers on the super speedways the last two years, at least. Always leading laps, always winning stages. He's got the one Daytona 500 win, but he probably should have. He almost won the Daytona 500 this year. So uh, a guy that, will, if he does make the round of 12, Talladega will be his friend. And he has a 27-point gap to the cut line, so Austin Cindric making the round of 12 is looking a lot more realistic than it did at the beginning of all this. But then stage three would happen. Um, eventually some strategy would shake out where Bubba Wallace and Ty Gibbs would stay out. Uh, it would allow them to get the lead. They would swap it a couple times. Uh, we had a funny little bit in the crowd where Bubba Wallace could not seem to pass Ty Gibbs, no matter the amount of run that he got. And uh, me and Dante would be like, please, Bubba, please. And then the entire section around us would laugh. And then, uh, then Bubba would take the lead, and then he would – I'm sorry, because it sounds like I'm slandering Bubba Wallace, but he would make – possibly the poorest line choice I've ever seen in a while and lose the lead immediately. And I was like, why did you go down there? And then everyone left. Then eventually he would get the lead back and we could all cheer. Uh, well, me and Dante cheered. But um, he would lead for a while. But then eventually the Penske Brigade would come back to the front. Joey Logano would take control of this race. Uh, and he would be uh, met with a new challenger of Daniel Suarez, who just seems to have this place figured out. And yeah, Daniel yeah. Suarez would actually take the lead away from Joey Logano. Those two would swap back and forth, and it was just going insane. And we were about to have uh, probably one of the craziest finishes of the season again at Atlanta until a Walmart sign fell off yep. of the fence. We were having a third line finally form, uh, led by uh, Chase Elliott and Ross Chastain and Bubba Wallace, and then a Walmart sign fell. Uh, Kyle Busch actually uh, led for a little bit. He was the one who took the lead from Ty Gibbs before Joey Logano took it. Uh, so Kyle Busch was, again, a factor at the end of the race. Uh, William Byron would make a charge, too, but that that those two really didn't, like, stand here at the end. So then we'd go back green. we have track house versus Pinsky because Ross Chastain has worked his way back up to fourth. They would have a side-by-side -side duel, but quickly there would be another caution when Noah Gregson would go head on to the wall down the backstretch. Another rough hit, but it wasn't nearly as bad as the Larson hit. And it's actually... Uh, Noah Gregson has raced at this racetrack, uh, I think, four times since it's been reconfigured because I know he missed the race last year. It might be five. No, it's three. My bad. Right, uh, and yeah. last year, and last year in the spring race, he would have the same exact wreck. Uh, pretty much, he would yeah. hit dead on to the inside wall. No, nope, that was what I'm sorry to keep going back and forth here, but that was when he was in the 16 car. So it was 2022 when he was doing the part time stuff for college when he hit because he was the first person to wreck. Dude, I guess it was, yeah. We're the first person to wreck. I'm sure he wrecked in the 42 car here, too. He wrecked in every single race in the 42 car. Sorry, no, Jackson. But uh, so, uh, but the restart would take shape. Uh, it was actually even for a lap between Daniel Suarez and Joey Logano. Then Ross Chastain, his car would have some handling issues going into one, get pretty loose. He'd fall off of Daniel Suarez. Joey Logano would get a big push from Ryan Blaney, take the lead of the race. Uh, then Chase Elliott would dive underneath Ross Chastain, get him loose, and Ross Chastain could not hang on to the car. 
he would react collecting Bubba Wallace and the story of the race. And we haven't mentioned him. And you're like, you're at a super speedway. You haven't mentioned Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin chose the strategy of staying in the back the entire race. Except, um, you know, eventually you're supposed to move forward. Um, He did not. He never made an attempt to run with the pack in this race. It was one of the weirdest, most bizarre things I've ever seen. And honestly, from all the clips I've seen, he didn't really have an answer for it. Uh, they made a strategy before the race because he was penalized. Well, and he, he wasn't penalized. He had a problem in qualifying with his car that made him qualify last. Um, and they chose before the race to stay in the back until the big wreck happened. The problem is the big wreck happened on the last lap. And um, he was in it. He found a way to be in the wreck. But there was a cool story that came out here because obviously Denny Hamlin's in the playoffs. Denny Hamlin pushed BJ McLeod to the lead at Talladega. And BJ McLeod actually stopped fully to miss the wreck because obviously underfunded car, can't risk getting your car beat up. He would let Denny Hamlin pass him at the line. Denny Hamlin is like trying his best to get to the line, car moving back and forth. And uh, he could not really get there and beat BJ, but BJ would stop. So Denny could pass him. Denny said that on the show. So I thought that was pretty cool, BJ. Uh, also, another playoff driver. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my That's life. race manipulation, Matt. My bad. He should be um, fine. He should yeah. have his throat slit. He should be suspended for the one more race he's going to do this year. Why are you talking? To, why are you talking about BJ like that? One of the nicest guys in the garage area. What? First, first joking about tragedies and then joking about race BJ manipulation. It's the worst. Okay, so Harrison Burton was also in this crash. He is a playoff driver, uh, I must say. Uh, he is one of the playoff drivers of all time. But um, he was in this crash. Uh, he ran like 15th the entire race. He did better than Harrison Burton normally does. Uh, but uh, he was trying to get his car across the line, and the car just kept doing circles. And the, they had circles again. He would not stop trying to finish the race for five minutes. He would continually try. They had to delay Joey Logano's celebration because Harrison Burton continued to try to get across the line. And eventually, they made him stop. Then finally, they had enough. And Todd Gillen actually backed his way across the line, which I thought was kind of funny. Everybody thought that was funny. But Joey Logano, again, I'm going to disappear from your screen because I did not memorize the top 10 this week. I'm sorry, guys. Jo and I want to get this right. Joey Logano would win the race, locking himself into the round of 12. Me and Will actually both had him out. So, uh, yep. it, but we also forgot the key thing. It's an even year. Joey Logano is going to make the final four. Um, but uh, an even year, Joey Logano is going to win a championship. He doesn't deserve to win. It's every other even year that he wins the championship, William. Oh, shoot. You're right. Um, Daniel Suarez comes home second. A big day for him. Uh, third was Ryan Blaney, fourth Christopher Bell, fifth Alex Bowman, seventh Tyler Rex, I mean, sixth Tyler Rex, seventh our first non-playoff driver, Kyle Busch, and actually the only non-playoff driver in the top ten. Um, eighth, Chase Elliott. Good job, Boo Bear. Ninth was William Byron, and tenth was Austin Sendrick. Now I'm going to run you through the points very quickly here. Joey Logano won, so he's on the way through. Ryan Blaney is 45 points to the good in second, should be safe. Christopher Bell, 40. Tyler Reddick, 33. William Byron, 33. Alex Bowman, great day for him. Another one of those guys that was on the edge of missing this round, in my opinion. 27 up. Austin Sendrick, also 27 up. Chase Elliott, 24. Daniel Suarez, a great big day for him. 22 up. Not safe by any means, but he runs well at Watkins Glen, too. I actually think Daniel Suarez is going to go through to the next round. Now, here's the first big one. Kyle Larson, who had a 40-point cushion starting this thing, is only 15 above the cut line. Denny Hamlin. It's two above the cut line. Ty Gibbs is one. On the outside looking in, we have two guys that you'd expect and two guys that you wouldn't expect. 13th, Brad Kinslowski, one point out, did not have good at handling car here at Atlanta, a place where we all thought he could win. Uh, 14th, Harrison Burton, 16 points out. 15th, and the guy that I'm really worried about not making it through here, Martin Truex Jr. The team has had 10 of the last 13 races finished outside of the top 24. This team is reeling, and they're 19 points out. But with this tire at Watkins Glen next week, I think this is Martin Truex's one shot to get through. If he doesn't win at Watkins Glen next week, I don't know that I see a path for him through. And again, another guy that I think might be in a must win here, Chase Briscoe, 21 out. All right. So that was the race. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about. So go ahead and kind of lead that. All right. So uh, arguably the biggest story of the weekend, because like, look, we have major playoff implications. It'd be one thing if the result of this race kind of just like reinforce what we all thought about the playoffs. But I mean, we're talking about 
again, like you said, Martin Truex, I'm sorry, there probably just isn't a route for him unless either A, he wins, or uh, his team just finds some speed. It is absurd how utterly slow the 19 team has been. Um, but uh, the biggest story of the weekend uh, was actually revolving around the NASCAR charter situation because it seems like we finally are reaching some definitive answers. Um, Matt, if you would like to uh, just sort of explain the announcement from 2311. Uh, 20, Vinny Hamlin's been very outspoken against this whole charter situation the entire time. Uh, and he was one of the biggest holdouts the entire time. But uh, first off, I'll go ahead and say this. Two, all the teams signed it. All the teams signed the deal that NASCAR put out, except two teams, 2311 and Front Row. This is very big not only because they are two of the fastest growing teams in NASCAR, but also because they are both in talks right now to buy another charter. In fact, they Front were, Row's- aside from Roush, they were the one, or sorry, RFK at least, those were the ones that you looked at and said, oh, well, we'll track house as well, I guess. Yeah. But, um, but Front, front Row is actually already announced a driver for the car. They bought the charter. So yeah. I don't know exactly how that all stands. They they really didn't put out much in their statement. But 2311 basically just said that they're not backing down uh, to NASCAR's demands because that's – I mean, I know you wanted to talk about the Rick Hendrick quote. Rick Hendrick said that he was just kind of tired of it and just signed it. Richard Childress said a similar thing, and so did Jeff Gordon. So 2311, this is kind of – unprecedented waters here i don't know what we're gonna do uh they, they could run as an open car next year but yeah. they're gonna lose a lot of money and these other teams have already signed the agreement nascar can't give 2311 a handout here they can't do that um they can't change the agreement just for these two teams so i don't really know what the solution is unless these guys are just gonna run as open cars but they won't survive doing that with this business model i mean there's like they just built airspeed so I don't see 2311 shutting down shop. I, I, I don't know what really the answer here is here. Well, I'll honest. tell you what the answer is, and it's unfortunate. They're just going to end up signing the shitty agreement. They're, they're going to hold out a little bit longer, yeah. and they're, they're going to sign a shitty agreement. But here's, here's the thing, and what is so shitty about um, the other teams bending at this point, because uh, like you talked about like, uh, Rick, Hendrick, like just tired of it. It's like, okay, I'm just going to be blunt here. Rick's not going to be – active in the sport 20, 30 years from now. You know, Jeff Gordon will, but Jeff Gordon right now is just going to parrot what Rick thinks. Even if I know we have the theories that, okay, Jeff pretty much just runs the thing nowadays. I'm sure he does. He's not going to go against Rick Hendrick's wishes. Richard Childress, he's not going to be a factor in this sport 15, 20 years from now. He arguably is not one now. This was something that we needed to get done now to protect the future of the business. And honestly, the owner's just proven, ah, yeah, yeah, you know, we'll we'll bend, we'll give up. That's so shitty. And it has left 2311 in front row out to dry because these are, uh, and I, I will say, I'm surprised that for a guy like Justin Marks, why did he sign the agreement? I, I, I don't understand um, because NASCAR did not make any of the important concessions. And from what I understand, NASCAR did exactly what they intended to do, which was they did like they, all the team. For those of you who don't know, all the team owners, they wanted to get in a room with NASCAR again, all of them, and have it out. NASCAR didn't want that to happen. They wanted to talk to the teams individually. And they said, no, because what's going to happen when the giant corporation talk? Like, let's just be real here. What's going to happen? When the leaders of the monopoly, right, talk to the individual members of the union. Union busting is what happened. That's what NASCAR did. They've done it in the past. It's shitty. That That's what they did. Like, they formed a union without forming a, a union, right, because NASCAR busted the driver's union that was going to happen back uh, in the, the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and... Yeah, it seems like they did just enough leveraging on enough of the teams to get them to agree to it. And yeah, uh, now, like again, Denny Hamlin, who is, again, you can, if if all you do is watch the race on Sunday and you just hate Denny Hamlin because of, you know, he's kind of a prick and he, uh, like, he, oh, he wrecked Chase Elliott or he this, that, and the third. Fine. Whatever. Denny Hamlin is trying to spearhead uh, the future of the sport, man. Like, this is so much more than just like, ah, God, like, because look, I was afraid of a strike. 
I was afraid of a lockout. Those are very real possibilities. We just had a notable lockout for Major League Baseball. Thank God the game is significantly better than it was, uh, or at least significantly more appealing than it was, so it didn't kill the sport. A lockout would absolutely kill NASCAR. And NASCAR knows that, right? Let's be real. I, I, this is just true. All of these teams, at their core, they're racing teams. They can go race in another league. They can form their own league. We talk about the issue in college football right now. We don't have a college football playoff format signed off on past 2026. And the Big Ten and the SEC are not going to sign off on a format where you get auto bids and their teams are excluded uh, unfairly so. The SEC and the Big Ten would be fine. Like, they they will play their own playoff, this, that, and the third. Like And look, it's a terrible situation, but it's like the IRL uh, and uh, the cart split. That happened because the individual teams and the, and especially the individual people at the top knew they could create an alternative. It These ruined the card for like a the decade, though. But it did. But who paid the price for that? Not the drivers. Not really the teams. Because if, if especially if you look back at that era, teams were still very well funded. Man, it was it was the sport that paid. It was the two individual leagues that were competing against each other. Right. I, I, uh, the main beneficiary of getting this deal done was NASCAR. The main, uh, the main body that would have been hurt by the deal not getting done was NASCAR. We couldn't have leaned a little bit longer saying that, oh, yeah, we just got tired of it. Yeah, motherfucker, we all are. What do you mean? Like the fans are tired of a lot of the bullshit that's NASCAR that NASCAR's done over the past 30 years. I know team owners are tired of it. Like, you don't just oh my god, you don't just end a holdout because you're you're tired of it. Like, think about like, okay, think about like when we get in the training camp in the NFL season, you have guys like, oh, they're holding out for a new contract because technically their contract isn't up for two or three years, but they're worth significantly more than their rookie deal, right? Do they just do they just say like oh yeah no I was tired of sitting no because they have the leverage they're the commodity the drivers are the commodity the teams are the commodity and NASCAR's failure to understand that should have bit them they should have had to bend and they didn't they got exactly what they wanted and now guess what in future negotiations the drivers and the teams have no leverage. Because they already gave up once. So why would they not do it again? If we're renegotiating, I don't know how, because like I know with NASCAR, it's not a CBA type thing. It's it's the individual team sign off on the agreement. So I don't know how, how long. It normally have runs it. through the TV deals. So it's probably, it's probably 2032 before they get another chance. Which that's the big thing here. NASCAR just signed these huge fucking TV deals. And the drivers and the teams deserve so much more of a cut from that than they were going to get it. They were. You cannot convince me otherwise. But unfortunately, we have too many of these teams that are just headed by people that aren't. That they, I don't want to say they don't care. Of course, they want to lie in their own pockets. Of course, they want the sport to be good right now. But again, if you're a Richard Childress or a Rick Hendrick, yeah. Why, why, why would you waste your time worrying about it? Yeah. And that's why they wanted to separate everybody. They knew not every single person cared all that much about this deal. Because not every single person is caring about the future. Duh! They'll be look dead. At, look at what has happened to Richard Childress. Why would he care about the future? Why would Rick care about the future? He's going to walk at the door and his organization is going to be just fine. Hendrick, Hendrick Motorsports. They're the closest team to breaking through right now or uh, breaking even, and even they don't. What? What the hell? I like. I I'm praying genuinely. I'm praying that it comes out that oh NASCAR made a few concessions and that's why this happened, but it's not. It's not what happened. So for the uh, for the good of the sport, you know, I hope this thing works out. I hope the deal wasn't as bad as it was made out to be. Maybe there were some last minute concessions and who knows, maybe it'll come out in about a month that, you know, Denny Hamlin saying like, oh yeah, you know, I was, 
there were a couple key points they didn't hit on, but you know, we got some important things done. Do you think that's what happened? No. So yeah. They uh strong arm from what uh, all I've heard or seen. So here's a big couple of these to NASCAR. But uh we go to Watkins Glen next weekend. They're supposed to bring a crazy tire. Uh that should be fun. So we'll get to see that. Uh also Juan Pablo Montoya will return to the Cup series next weekend. Speaking of 2311. That'll be fun. Hopefully he runs good. Uh we will also have AJ Allmendinger and SVG in the field. So we might have some spoilers there. Uh and with tires being an important thing, I think that is a big advantage to three people specifically, who uh Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex, and Brad Kislowski. Um, I think Brad Kislowski has not had a top ten on a road course in years. Uh it is bad. As a guy who almost won this race back in 2012 when tires were a bad, well, not a bad thing, were a good thing, and they showed where. Uh, he will probably run a little better, hopefully. Uh, Martin Truex, to me, is the favorite going into this race because he is the only guy that is good at road courses right now that has gotten to experience both sides of the ball here with the tires, of them just being indestructible and them being good race tires. Um, yeah. And it, I think it'll help Denny Hamlin. Denny Hamlin did used to be a little better on the road courses in the mid 2010s. Uh, we all know that he choked away that uh, 2016 Sonoma race at the end, which uh, I'm sure we're all thankful that he choked it away to Tony Stewart. But uh, he, he's put himself in situations where he could have won, and he might have won a Glen race. I, I don't. I don't remember. Sorry, guys. The, the, did he not win? A, he won at the Glen in like 2016, didn't he? Yeah, I think so. Um, cause I know, uh, Logano won 15 cause Harvick ran out of gas in the last lap, but I don't 16 at blackout because junior wasn't racing, but, uh, so we have a lot to talk about next week, but I think for the most part, unless Will has anything else to say, that concludes the show. Nope. That's it. Fuck NASCAR. <laughs> and we're not going to sit here to the end like we did last week where uh, Will just says random things unless he would like to. Will, do you have anything random to say or any story in your life you want to tell right now? Now let's get out of here. Okay, cool. Now I'm going to talk about why did the Columbus baseball team 